All right, Eric. Next up, I think this this next one gets the award for most creative title. I'm just going to put that out there. Also, the next presenter also has a nice setup that I recall from uh, from from last year. So, without further ado, let's bring on our next speaker, Scott from Stack Hall. Hey, Scott. Hey guys, how are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm super good. I'm super glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Always happy to have you. And uh, we'll let you just take it away from here so you have some more time. Awesome. Remember, all right, so there's a lot of like Q&A. So you guys might need to pop back in and out. Just give sure. me a heads up. I'm down for that. All right, cool. Hey, everybody. I'm Scott Gerlach, uh, CSO, co-founder at Sackhawk. Uh, a little bit about me in a bit. Today, we're talking about being on the lookout for broken object level authorization. BOLA. BOLO? BOLA. It's kind of a hard thing to understand, but we'll go through it. There's a, a recent one that happened last month that is a really good example. So, big fix, we're largely dealing with SAS and SCA kinds of findings and fixing problems in source code. I really like big fix because I think it makes a huge difference. There's a lot of talk about supply chain security and open source vulnerabilities now. And a lot of solutions to that problem include making new artifacts, and this and that. But what's really needed in this realm is help. Open source package developers need to help finding and fixing these vulnerabilities in their packages to make significant dents into the problem here. And I think Big Fix is an amazing way to rally a community around the idea of helping to improve not only AppSec, but some of the supply chain issues we have today. It's not a silver bullet. A little bit needs to be more done with delivery systems and a ton of other things, but perfect is the enemy of good. And I'm super excited to be a part of Big Fix. My good friends, Jesse and Chester agree with me. Great. So let's get into this. There are some things that you can't find with SCA and SAST. We're talking about things like HTTP header issues, cookie safety, a few of the OWASP API top 10. Uh, we're talking about IDOR. So if you've ever heard the term IDOR, that's insecure direct object reference. Uh, there's also broken, sorry, broken function level authorization. Can a regular user use the admin functions in the API? That's broken function level authorization. And of course, the one that we're talking about today, BOLA, broken object level authorization. And you can think about BOLA as, I like to think about it simply, can customer A access the assets of customer B? This is also known in the development world as tenancy filtering, but here we are, we'd like to make up other terms for security issues. So now there's a pretty big, large scale BOLA that was discovered last month. We're talking about remote car access functions. So there was a huge thread uh, and shout out to Sam Curry. If you want to read more into this, like later, not right now, because we're doing this, but later, if you want to, if you want to read more into this, go to samcurry.net. The link's down there, kind of in the bottom of the screen. Dig more into this. Um, but Sam Curry's work on the remote car function API, he and his team found a lot of problems with those APIs from account takeover to no care, no character filtering issues and a ton of backend systems that were accessible. Um, so again, samcurry.net. Um, uh, but I like to imagine that when Sam and his friends found these issues, they probably said, dude, that's, that's not my car. Okay, maybe they didn't say that, but the entire title of the talk and the bit is based upon that. So let's just pretend that they did say that and we'll keep going. Oh, okay, sure. I wanna focus on one of these issues that's here and that's this one. So in this particular issue, Sam and friends found that they could pass a car's VIN number into this endpoint and get an auth token that gave them access to the account owner's information as well as run commands on the car itself all by only knowing the VIN number. Now you can kind of see how the object and its owner can perhaps get a bit confused in these car systems. Essentially they have to make an object, the car, and associate it with an owner. And that's usually done at the dealership or during some kind of registration process. But getting how these systems work on these entities together wrong has dramatic effects. Like perhaps dude, where's my car situation? maybe a little less dramatic and probably a lot less misogynistic, but like the car disappearing part would probably be the same. Now there's a lot of that goes into how this attack worked, but suffice to say when they found the system that allowed them to control the car by only knowing the VIN number and worse yet gain access to 
and account owner's information also by only knowing the VIN number, which gives you control of the car. And for those that don't know, the VIN number, vehicle identification number, is a pretty public piece of information. It's printed on a little metal sticker right underneath your windscreen or windshield. That key piece of information can now give you logical access to its functions, including unlock and start. That's a real life BOLA, broken object level authorization. So now that we've seen a real life BOLA, let's jump into some uh, what systems might, or systems and code might look like that could probably make a generic looking BOLA issue. And for that, we need a fictional car company, I think. All right, you guys, just chill out a bit. Give, get, let me get a second here. We've got our Scotty Co Cars Inc. Scotty Co Cars Inc. is a new startup. It builds plutonium based cars that travel. No, wrong, wrong bit. Okay. Uh, this is a basic system, right? So this is a basic customer car registration system. Clearly there's more needed for this to be an actual car database, but we've got to have something to work with. So we can see that we have a customer registration and the customers are tied to cars. We're setting up the basics of our authorization in our tables, but how does this pro problem start showing itself in our API systems? An owner can have one car or more cars associated with them and some very basic data about the car. Yes, the clear text password field is a joke. People, please always, always salt and hash your passwords. Scotty Kill Cars API has a couple of different functions. Uh, it has functions that allow us to start the car. Uh, it has functions that allow us to lock and unlock, disable. Um, we're also working on a remote seat heater enablement, but that's going to be a subscription feature. We'll add that later. Can you guys or anyone in the chat uh, identify the first issue that we have, we might have in this API here? Get, uh, get cars. <laughs> mm. I mean, I shouldn't be able to get a list of everybody's car. Oh, Brian's way at the back. Me, the... me down here. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. I might know. Way um, down at the end of the conference table. Yeah. Um, maybe there's uh, incremental VIN numbers that you can go through potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So own. probably calling the VIN number directly, probably not a good idea. That right there is an IDOR. Mm. Insecure direct object reference. So what so you want right? to do. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, you wouldn't want to be able to just like start poking numbers into these APIs. You'd want to like obfuscate that a little bit. And so when we did that, we actually use car ID, which ties to a VIN number, right? So here's what that looks like. We're going to pretend that we fixed our API routes and we're now using car ID. So what does some of the code that backs these things look like? Let's take a look at the unlock function. Again, this is sample code at the end of our conference room table, again, anyone can point out the problem in this guy. There's no syntax highlighting, I'll tell you that much. There is no syntax highlighting because that doesn't work well in a presentation. That's a great question, great call, great call. You're letting user input into the SQL query, so probably SQL injection vulnerability. Mm. Really good call. Oh yeah. That is a SQL injection. So this is actual double whammy here because this is SQL injection, but the good thing and bad thing about this particular thing, our SAS tools would find this, right? Our SAS tools would be like, just like this big red wavy flag. Hey, don't do that. That's direct concatenation of a SQL query. That'll get you in trouble almost every time. So we've got this prepared statement with our parameterized queries. There's still a problem here though. What might the other problem here be? And what do you think SAS would say about this? I do not compute. <laughs> okay. So we've parameterized this query. We've, we've taken the prepared statement. We've made it into a prepared statement. And we said, Hey, give me the VIN where the car ID equals car ID. What we haven't done is say, does that car belong to that user? So here's uh, where, here's where our Bola starts. Yep. Here's where our Bola starts popping out. We have, we have the ability to pass in and sanitize car ID. So, okay, you got to know the car ID, but theoretically you might be able to guess a car ID. So if you only have the car ID and the customer, the user goes, Hey, I would like to get access to this car ID and unlock this car. In this particular query, how this is kind of built here, we have not authorized 
validated that the user is authorized to unlock that particular car. Because we haven't done that, here is how a, a Bolo would start showing up in some of our code. So like I mentioned before, this code looks clean. Our SaaS tool would go, yep, good job. This is very much a business logic function error. So you have to kind of know how the system works to be able to find these things. And that's exactly what Sam and his friends were doing is fiddling with the system to figure out how it works to see if they could abuse how it works. Again, here are our problem is where we're just saying where the car ID is the thing. So now we're past it. So if we're going to fix this, we would do something like this. We would say select VIN from car where car ID equals question mark and customer ID equals question mark. Pass those in from the session, making sure that they're not being tampered with by the user. Run our SQL statement and get back to VIN. Now, the other thing that's a little weird about this is that when you when we teach BOLA and we teach IDOR and we teach those things, we use stuff that looks like this, right? We reuse write SQL queries, um, write SQL queries wrong, use parameterized queries, all that good stuff. This is in much better, sa much better shape, but it probably isn't the safest thing to do or the most optimal or very object oriented at all. So you're gonna have stuff that is a car model or car object. This is more object model-y, how this should work. Most people aren't writing that straight SQL into their apps, like I said. Frameworks provide you object models that let you abstract the SQL. They're generally more SQL injection safe, but they're not necessarily BOLA safe. So here is that example of a more object model-y way of doing exactly what we talked about before. But the problem in it is a bit less obvious. It's harder to see like just raw SQL where stuff is getting injected or raw where queries, right? It's harder to find that. But this still has this new object E, object model E code still has this problem because we're doing, again, we're doing uh, this dot car repo dot find by ID and passing the car ID. Again, we haven't sanitized that the car belongs to the user. So a way that this would actually look, so this is all when you're setting up object model, right? So if I was setting up the car, the car repo object model, I'd build some functions that say, make sure that the join in those in the table we looked at earlier uh, is, is honored. Make sure that the car that we're pulling back actually belongs to the user. We would build a function that looks a little bit more something like this. The right way to tackle that, um, is to build this, this filter function and build a very specific filter function. Um, and that is find by ID and customer ID. So now I've got car repo, find by ID, customer ID, pass the car ID and the customer ID, make sure those things match, then return the car, uh, the VIN number. So we can do our unlock, remote unlock. So that makes sure, uh, the only thing that's left here is making sure that the we're not trusting these data inputs as being passed by something the user controls. So if that's in a payload that the customer can control, the user can control, and we're sending a payload to the API that has VIN number or car ID and customer ID, we got to make sure that those things are the right things and they haven't tampered with them. And that's usually something you can do in session or JWT or some other thing that's uh, cryptic cryptographically signed or not controlled by the customer. And if it is uh, and tampered with, you have indication that it's being tampered with. So that's that's what our BOLA looks like. You guys, anybody got questions about BOLA and how that might work? No, I right. think you 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 kind of clarified that very, very well to where uh, I don't have any questions about that. No. no questions. All right, cool. Easily explain, Eric, questions? No, I agree. Uh, I, I feel bad now that I didn't get either of those two right and Brian got me <laughs> pissed off now. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> Don't feel bad. It's okay. Is so there let's... a chance for Eric to redeem himself? Yes, absolutely. Oh, great. Okay, cool. There Thanks. we go. Yep. <laughs> Eric, if you found a bolo, what would you do? Ebola or a bolo? A, a bolo, broken object level authorization. I would immediately uh, open a ticket and uh, <laughs> get it take care of it the way you showed great answer 
<laughs> is okay. So if you find a, a broken object level authorization, what do you do? Call Scott. First, first of all, is this your app? If it is, pair up with security team and dev teams to work through the attacks and the fixes, right? There's obviously some um, company uh, process that logic process that is supposed to be taking place here that is not being taking place. And there's some bypass. So working together with security teams and developer teams, really good way to address these things and fix them. Uh, add some kind of test to make sure it doesn't get reintroduced. And then the last thing here, super important, document what happened and review that with teams. You know, a lot of, sometimes security teams get a little too like, hmm, can't, it's a secret. I can't tell you what happened, but nobody learns that way. So if you take this information and you go back and you go, hey, we had a pretty severe security issue that we found and nothing bad happened, but let's talk about it and review it and see what happened. Everybody starts learning and can start thinking about like, Hey, if I'm building a system like this and it's a customer and an object that I got to put together, I got to make sure the filtering's right. All right. So that's what to do if it is your app. What if it's someone else's app? Okay. First of all, do you have permission if, uh, if to do testing on this app? If not, don't just walk away. People have done a lot of jail time for a lot simpler things than this. If you don't have permission, don't do. If you do have permission, remember responsible disclosure is your friend. Let the security team know, tell them how to reproduce it. Tell them what the impact is. Be patient with them because it often takes a long time to get some of that stuff uh, prioritized and escalated internally and then help them validate the fix, right? So they're gonna go, hey, we fixed it. Can you validate it? Test again, like help them along the journey if they've introduced something like this into production, they either accidentally missed it or just didn't know about it. That's all I got, you guys. Thank you so much for having me at Big Fix. You got Brian and Eric, thank you for having me. I appreciate you playing along, answering some questions, uh, trying to trying to guess my, my tough answers. Um, and I think I got you right back on track. Yeah, buddy. You're profesh. <laughs> this, this is more stupid stuff you can put on Twitterverse. Go. Oh, hold on. We got to make you big screen again. Oh, okay. Okay. Ready? And go. No, that's you. Oh, wait. Yeah, that is me. No. Who who did that? <laughs> Eric's trolling me. It's got to be Eric. Hands off. <laughs> uh, oh, Scott, that was fantastic, man. It's super entertaining and educational. So uh, thank you for all that. Thank you for helping us get on time perfectly on time. And you also afforded me the opportunities to use some of the other visual effects that I didn't get a chance to do prior. Oh. So uh, I'm here champion. to help. I'm, yeah. I'm here to serve and help. So it was a pleasure and uh, see you around. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Good luck, Randall. <laughs>